Amen. Well, we're glad everybody can join us in person and then uh, virtually here on Facebook Live. And uh, I'm still learning the language and trying to figure the ins and outs, but it does help when you share. If you're watching and then you share it, then everybody that you are a friend with can also see or however that works. But uh, we are grateful to be able to get the word out there. The word of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus, we just thank God for the opportunity to preach this word uh, well beyond the borders of our community. So, amen, amen. Now, um, <clears throat> this has been a, an amazing day, hasn't it? Beautiful weather, the sun's been shining, the sky's been so blue. Uh, but what an amazing opportunity that we can still gather ourselves together and hear the word, receive the word, but we can bring our supply of the Spirit and create something wonderful together. It's, I mean, by yourself, you're wonderful enough. You understand that. Uh, you have the glorified, resurrected Christ living on the inside of you. And by yourself, you're, you are amazing. But as a member of the body of Christ, you were designed to fit into a body uh, and to um, have a supply that you bring with other members. And so together, we create something that you didn't have all day. You didn't have this all day because we weren't all together, were we? But we're here now, so what an exciting moment. Uh, we're going to just continue. I don't know how we're going to label this, Russ, but part two uh, from Sunday. Uh, I haven't been able to get away from Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, if I could invite your attention there. Chief, we good? Everything sound good? Working good? Praise the Lord. Uh, and for those who are going to send any hate mail, address it to Chief Lewis. Uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. And then he knows what to do with the hate mail. Anything that's good and loving and kind, just send it to me, and I'll take care of that. Uh, so over in Romans chapter 14, I want to show you something here. Uh, we established the context in which this uh, passage was written this past Sunday. And uh, we know that Paul the Apostle was dealing with uh, uh, some dietary rules and regulations and special days, days that uh, a brother or sister or a group may consider special. And then uh, for those who consider every day special, I mean, you know, you're going to have some diversity in the body of Christ, aren't you? You're, you will always have some diversity, and diversity is fine. It's nothing to be afraid of. You know, we can't just make everybody uh, be like us. I don't want the world to be like me. What a boring world it would be if everybody uh, was just like me. And so I like diversity. I, in fact, I like it when you have different ethnic uh, neighborhoods in a community, in a city. Uh, now, we really don't have that here, closer into Chicago, obviously. You have, you know, Greek town, you have little Italy, uh, Italy you have Chinatown. Uh, you know, I like that. I like that diversity. And, and we're, depending on where you go, it takes on the flavor of that group, doesn't it? Like, when you go to Chinatown, you don't go look around and think, gee, I wonder if I'm in Greek town. No, you're in Chinatown, right? And so it's okay here you are at this church. It's okay to come in here and say, oh, you, man, you guys must be of the more charismatic Pentecostal persuasion. Absolutely, because that's what we are. Nothing wrong with that. And so we want to be careful uh, as it pertains to judging and criticizing one another and putting each other down with some of the different things, some of the diversity or some of the preferences. And Paul is dealing with some of these things here. Uh, and I love the fact that he gets over to verse number 17 and he just says straight out, hey, listen, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. That's pretty simple, isn't it? The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Contemporary English version said God's kingdom isn't about eating and drinking. It's not about eating and drinking. God's kingdom does not consist of what a person eats or drinks. Well, what is it then, Paul? Well, I'm glad you asked, because he goes on and he says, well, here's what it's about. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what the kingdom of God is about. And we've defined it this way. As you think, uh, now I'm using the King James Version, 
That word righteousness, basically, we can, we can say it this way, right standing, to be, to be in right standing, to be in right standing, righteousness, right standing, right now. We have right standing, right? You have right standing. And then he says peace, and then he says joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, I wrote down a couple of different, uh, different renderings, different translations, which uh, puts a little different light on things. I use the King James Version of the Bible as a base. And uh, you know that the King James Version uh, is the Elizabethan English. Uh, it was uh, the, uh, known as the Authorized Version uh, in 1611. So this has been in use for a long time. And we jokingly tell people that, well, this is the version that Jesus and the disciples preached out of. Certainly the Apostle Paul used this to preach out of it. No, he didn't. And neither did Jesus. We jokingly say that. But as a base. Now, there are other translations that you can glean from as well. I like to do that. I like to look up other translations. So listen to this. The New Living, it says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Wow. God's Word translation says, God's kingdom does not consist of what a person eats or drinks. Rather, God's kingdom consists of God's approval. Well, wouldn't you like to have God's approval? I certainly would. I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty important to have the approval of some people in your life when you were growing up. Didn't you want the approval of a parent or both parents? You know, when you were in school, maybe you had some teachers that, you know, uh, you liked particular teachers, you wanted their approval. I met someone the other day uh, in Chicago, in fact, reminded me of my English professor in school. I, I was like, it took me a moment because it took me aback and I went, wow. And he was dressed exactly as uh, this professor would, uh, would have dressed. His mannerisms, <clears throat> the way he carried himself, I thought, whew, hold on, I'm, I'm having a, a, a head trip here. And I told him, he says, oh wow, that was quite an honor for me to compare him to a man that I admired and had made, uh, left a, an impact on me. And so the uh, contemporary English version, God's kingdom isn't about eating and drinking. It is about pleasing God and living in peace and about true happiness. And all this comes from the Holy Spirit. So the reason we're taking the time to come back to this, and we've got one more passage to connect with this, is because now more than ever, uh, we are tempted to be distracted. We've always been that way. But there are certain distractions today that are very confusing because there is so much going on in the world that hasn't happened before. You know, and I know that there's a lot of talk about, hey, listen, there's, you know, in times like these, it helps to remember there have always been times like these. Well, yes, there have always been corrupt men with wicked plans. Uh, there has always been confusion. There have always been people who think that, well, listen, if you don't do it this way, you're wrong. But what I'm trying to tell you is that the time that we're living in, we've never seen some of these things before. Some of these things are just crazy, and you're like, wow, we see the Bible playing out right before our very eyes. And we certainly must be closer to the end than we've ever been. There's nothing left yet. There's nothing left to fulfill for the rapture of the church to take place. The rapture of the church or the catching away is the next thing on the prophetic calendar. And there are no signs. Uh, you're not going to see a sign pointing to the rapture. It's just going to take place. And then all of a sudden, we're going to be gone. And while we're on this thought, and I'm not done here, but while we're on this thought, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, the scripture makes it very clear that the trumpet's going to sound. There's going to be a shout of the archangel. The trumpet's going to sound. And the Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. The dead in Christ. In other words, those people, uh, Christian people, people of faith, who have died, their bodies 
are going to rise. They're going to be brought back from whatever form they're in. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And the Lord Jesus is going to give those dead in Christ, he's going to give them their bodies back. And then we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. Guess what's going to happen? We're going to be changed in the moment and twinkling of an eye. We're going to be caught up together to be with them. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the catching away or the rapture that I'm speaking of. But right before we go, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. They get their bodies back. They get their bodies back. Isn't that exciting? So everybody that you know and love, who's died in Christ. Their body is sleeping. I don't care what form it's in. I don't care if it's at the bottom of the ocean or if it's in space floating around. They get those bodies back and then we're, we're changed and we're caught up. And uh, when we're all gone, now think about this for just a moment. This is a crazy thought. The last time I checked and you do some research and there's these statistics and these organizations and groups, they tell you that more Americans claim or profess a faith in God, a faith in the Lord Jesus, right? We still have a healthy number of believers, evidently, in America. What happens when we're all gone suddenly? That's a big gap, isn't it? Boy, that could weaken a nation. That could weaken us and make us vulnerable to what the Bible says is going to happen. You know, you read the end of the you you read end time stuff, and as I've been thinking about this a lot more lately, uh, the United States of America is not mentioned, but some of these other nations that are in the spotlight right now are mentioned. Iran, Turkey, Israel, these different nations, they're all mentioned, but not the U.S. Got me thinking about that. Well, there wasn't a U.S. when the Bible was written. Well, the point I'm trying to make is what if all of a sudden all these Christians are just raptured out of here? What's that going to do to us, our infrastructure? It's going to make us vulnerable. The church is standing in the way of so much and she doesn't even realize it. You know, we're, we're on this project or, you know, we're campaigning for this or we're doing that and the other thing and you don't even realize that your very presence is holding back some very dark stuff. Your very presence. Your very presence is holding back some very dark stuff. Just by you being here, because you are, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Jesus said that about you. He said, you're the salt and the light. Salt is a preservative, but it also enhances flavor, doesn't it? Salt, if it loses its saltiness, what good is it? So I've been thinking a lot about these things because as I pay attention to what's happening, on the shores of time, and I see that sun going, setting. I mean, we are literally so close, we have no idea. It could be at any moment. And so what does that do to you? What does it, cause, what is, what is it engender in you? What does it cause you to think and feel? Listen, I want to do this right. I, I want to be counted faithful. I want the Lord to take notice. I want Daddy's approval. I want my Father's approval. I want, him to, I want him to look and say, good boy, you're doing exactly what I want you to do. There are many things that I could get entangled in or get caught up in. There are many things that can consume me, my time, my energy, and my resources. But only one thing, he, Jesus said, he said, to, he said to Martha, only one thing is needful, and your sister has chosen that part, Mary and Martha. You know the story, right? You know, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Here's Jesus in their home. He got invited over for dinner. And Martha's in the kitchen worrying about this. I mean, I don't know if she was making tuna melts. I don't know if she was making PB&Js. I don't know what Martha was cooking in the kitchen. And she got upset at her sister. And she said, don't you even care that my sister isn't even helping? And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, Martha. You're so worried about so many different things. I'll bet you. And we can ask him later. I'll bet you Jesus would have said, you know what, girl? If you want to serve a fluffernutter, I'll be happy. Now, some of you might be thinking, a what? Peanut butter and fluff. That's a fluffernutter. It's a, it's a Northeast thing. I used to eat those as a kid. Peanut butter, and then you put the marshmallow fluff, and you got to have that good, dense bread. Not that soft, rip-apart bread, but that good, dense bread. 
and the more marshmallow fluff, the better. Jesus would have been okay if Martha said, wait a minute, Lord, hold on. I want to I want to get in on what you're doing right now. Hold on. I'm going to throw some peanut butter and some fluff on a sandwich. Is that all right with you? He would have been, girl, just get out here and sit here. Sit at my feet like your sister's doing. There are many things that we could get involved in, and they would be good. Who can argue with the fact that you want a good spaghetti and meatball dinner? I wouldn't mind that. I don't mind when my wife takes her time. She made chicken cutlets tonight. Yeah, baby. Oh, my. They were very good. You can get involved in many things that consume you, and they take your focus and your energy. But I'm wondering, at the end of time, which is where we are, which is what we are, we are the end of time church. We're the out of time church. We are the out of time church. Isn't that exciting? This is it, man. We get to wrap this thing up. So what are we doing about it? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting kind of excited thinking, huh, you know, he gets the last laugh. And he's in the heavens laughing right now thinking, you know, you guys, you, you little peons down there, you make all your plans and you spin your little web and you do this and you do that. But at the end, guess who gets the last word? He does. And I'd rather have his approval. See, because that's what I was talking about was having God's approval. I want his approval. The kingdom of God consists of God's approval and peace. That word peace also means prosperity and protection, nothing lacking, nothing missing, nothing broken, as well as the joy that the Holy Spirit gives. So if you're wondering what you should be thinking about at this end of time or out of time place that we find ourselves, the kingdom of God is not about rules and regulations. It's not about restrictions. It's not about this and that and the other. Listen, if you want to campaign against sin and you want to campaign against the Democrats or the Republicans or the end or whoever, you know, you're going to have your hands full. How about we just focus on righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost? And everything else will sort of work out that way. Right standing, God's approval, I'm right with God. As one, as one young fellow said to me, he said, you know what, I may not always say and do the right thing, but at least I'm right with God. I remember when he said that to me. I was in the home as, uh, as a uh, chaplain ministering to the family who just lost the mother in the home, and he said, I may not always say and do the right thing, but at least I'm right with God. And I said, my goodness, man, what else is there? At least I'm right with God. Righteousness. And that word peace is so encompassing. God wants you to have peace in your life. He doesn't want your peace to be disturbed continually. And I understand there are some people and circumstances that that's their whole mission in life is to disrupt your peace. I understand that. But Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. Don't let people disrupt your peace. Yeah, but it's your Christian duty to get involved here, is it now? How about I just get with God and see what he has for me? Because I can, expect, I can spend all of my time, my energy, and my resources on trying to save the world, and I'm not the Savior. That's one of the great lessons I had to learn, is I'm not the Savior. Well, you're supposed to do this because you're a pastor. Well, who told you? What pastor book did you read? I'm not supposed to try to be everything and do everything. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, as I was thinking about this, I, I thought about taking you back just a couple of chapters here to chapter 12. Thinking about chapter 12 now. And show you this here in chapter 12. So, righteousness, peace, and joy. That simplifies it for me. The kingdom of God. The reign and the rule of God. Really, when we're talking about the kingdom, we're talking about where God reigns and rules. And I'll tell you, honestly, the trouble is some people don't allow God full reign and full rule in their life. That's really what the trouble is for many people. It's not that you're, <laughs> it's not that you're, you're practicing the wrong religion. It's not that you're reading the wrong version of the Bible. It's simply that Jesus does, is not reigning and ruling like he should because you won't let him. There is a big difference, you know. You can acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Oh yes, we know that he is. He died on that cross, I have no problem. However, 
is he the Lord and Savior of your life? It's a personal thing, isn't it? It's, that's why people say this is a personal relationship. Well, I didn't know you could have a personal relationship with God. You need to have one with him. And you can do that through a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. Well, I never met him. Well, you ought to <laughs> before it's too late because you're going to meet him one day. And so now, over in Romans chapter 12, I made this transitional statement here that uh, um, he's not reigning and ruling like he should. Now, if you're waiting, here's, here's the secret or the key. If you're just waiting for him to just bust down the door and come in and take charge, he won't. In Revelation, he says, I'm standing at the door and I am knocking, the door of your heart. He stands at the door and he knocks. If any man hear my voice, open the door, I will come in. That tells me that there are people that hear his voice, but refuse to open the door. And what's he going to do? He's not going to kick the door down. It's all about your choice. That's why some of the language that you might hear used in a meeting or in church services, have you uh, made a personal decision? Have you invited the Lord Jesus into your heart? Yeah, well, that's why people say that, because you have to hear his voice, open the door, and then he comes in. And so as we're speaking about the reign and the rule of the king, uh, where, that's where the kingdom of God is, he wants to establish that kingdom in you. That's what he wants to do. You're not just an ambassador. You are in the entire embassy. You represent him. You represent God. You represent God's kingdom. So wherever you are, that's where the kingdom of God is. Yes, there is a place where Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. There is a place right now called heaven. I don't know where it is. I've never been there. But when you understand that he has taken up residence within your heart because you asked him to or you opened the door, he comes in and establishes his kingdom. Well, goodness gracious, what's the kingdom of God like? It's like peace, man. It's a kingdom of peace. It's a, it's a kingdom of protection and provision and prosperity. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. And it's a joyful kingdom. We get this idea that church is so sad we're supposed to look, you know, we're all supposed to have our heads all hung down and, you know, my God, we're supposed to be sad and, oh, this is a serious thing. This is the house of God. Silence becomes the house of God. Well, I disagree with that. I mean, how about that Bible verse that says, let us make a joyful noise. Let us come before him with dancing and singing and celebration. I don't think heaven is a quiet, somber place, folks. And you can't help but get excited when you start thinking about the goodness of God and what he's delivered you from and what he's redeemed you from. You can't help but get excited when you understand that his plan for your life is so good, he describes it in three-dimensional terms. Let me show you what I mean. You ready? Chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. So you know that Paul is addressing youthrens, the brethren, the Christians. Anytime he says brethren, he's talking about us. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now hold on. I got to do something with my body? Yes, you do. If you don't, your body will do something with you. Your body will run you and rule you. Well, isn't that kind of the way it's supposed to be? Well, not when you understand that your body is simply a tabernacle, a tent, or an earth suit that's meant for temporary use. This body that you're in right now, it's going to have to be made new someday, but this ain't that day. And so you have to take charge of your body so that it will do what it was designed to do, and that's to transport you through this life, right? Right? to enable you to fulfill the plan and the call of God, to do what he's called you to do and ask you to do, it'd be a shame to be a preacher and you had no vocal cords. How are you going to preach? Watch, I'm going to preach to you right now. No vocal cords, that wouldn't work, would it? Well, what if God called you to be a professional juggler and you don't have any hands and arms? What are you going to do? That wouldn't work out, 
right? I mean, what if you were, you know, called to jump the pogo stick, but you had no legs? How are you going to do that? Getting kind of silly, isn't it? But this is what we do. We make excuses and we say, well, it must be what God wants. No, I'm going to present my body a living sacrifice. I'm going to tell my body what it's going to do. You're going to get in line, body. You're going to do what I need you to do when I need you to do it. And when it's under attack, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to speak the word of God. I'm going to resist the devil and he's going to flee from me. But notice it's not just the body you have to do something with. Look at verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, wait a minute. So now I've got to do something with my mind? Yeah, you've got to take charge of your body and you have to take charge of your thought life. You have to do something with your body and you have to do something with your thought life because the king wants to reign and rule in and through you. But as long as your body tells you what you're going to do and as long as your mind is unrenewed, how are you going to accurately represent the kingdom? How will you accurately represent the things of God when your body is just going cuckoo, does whatever it wants, whenever it wants, you know? And when your mind is unrenewed and you don't even understand the things of God, but yet you hear people talking about it online or you watch uh, people on TV or you read books and so then you adopt that as your own personal belief in theology, whether or not it even lines up with the Word of God. One of those things that, one of the, I'll give you a perfect example. Do you know how many times people have said to me, well, you know, Pastor, <laughs> the, he, you know, money is the root of all evil. Where do you get that from? Well, that's in the Bible. No, it's not. Money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money. Money can't be the root of all evil because it's an inanimate object. It does nothing but just <laughs> enables you right now. And so people have a habit of, of twisting and turning things that, that aren't even biblical. And then folks who don't have themselves in check and don't have a balance in life, they say, oh, that sounds, yeah, I know that's right. And then they start repeating it. And then they start promoting it. And what they're doing is they're promoting deception without even realizing it. The Bible never says that money is the root of all kinds of evil. Listen, if you don't want your money, give it to me. I know what to do with it. Well, well, I've had one guy say, well, you know, I got this money, uh, it's, it's kind of dirty. There ain't no such thing as dirty money. Give it to me, I'll make it clean. I'll run it through the church and we'll put it to the, you know, to, for the things of God and everything will be just fine. You I mean, even though I got it illegally, I don't care where you got it from, man. Go, if it's Al Capone's, dig it up and bring it here. He's still got money missing or something? Somebody said, well, we're going to find his money. Well, go find it and bring it here. We'll take care. We'll put it to good use. We'll make it clean. Hallelujah. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Watch this, so that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. There's the three-dimensional will of God. It's so big and it's so... This is my interpretation. This is the way I perceive this and understand this. This is what came to me several years ago as I was reading this. And I said, hot diggity dog. The will of God is three-dimensional. It's good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. That helped. No matter which way I look at this thing, it's good, acceptable, and perfect. God's will for your life is always good acceptable and perfect. There's a three-dimensional view for you. If it doesn't fit into one of those views or one of those dimensions, then you have a right and you have the authority to resist it and say, no, you don't. It's not the will of God for you to be broke, busted, and disgusted. It doesn't mean that you won't experience being broke, busted, and disgusted. It just means that that is not the will of God for your life. It is not the will of God for your life to be confused and to be full of fear, and to be dreadful and panicking and having anxiety. Listen, anxiety attacks are no joke. People, people get gripped with, with fear. They get overcome with these things. That's not right. That's not the will of God. Well, I, 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 I need some help, Pastor. I need somebody to help me. Well, he, you know, the good news is when there's nobody there in the middle of the night, you can help yourself. But how? You can start speaking the word of God out over your situation. See, when, when fear and panic and dread come in, you speak right back and say, oh no, absolutely not. 
All things are working together for my good. That includes this thing. So I refuse to worry about it. And I will not lie awake at night having anxiety over this. Listen, I know what I'm talking about because I've got to combat it myself. There's things that I, I wake up in the middle of the night and my brain doesn't know how to go to sleep. Like, what are we worrying about this for at 2.30 in the morning, Mayor, Mr. Brain? Oh, wait a minute. What did he say? By the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I take my body and I say, hey, enough, enough, enough. And mine, guess what? I'm going to think about the things that God said. Think on these things. Let me con conclude with something here. Praise the Lord. I appreciate your patience. I appreciate your uh, perseverance as we weather the heat wave without air conditioning. Uh, Philippians is where I want you to go. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Look at it this way. I mean, it could be 20 below, and you could be complaining that it's cold in here. Praise God. So, understanding the kingdom of God, where God reigns and rules, understanding that he set up, and let me say it this way to you, when you opened up your heart and life to Jesus, he set up shop in you. You understand what I mean when I say that, right? When you opened up your heart and life, because he stood at the door and he knocked, and you heard his voice, and you opened the door, and you invited him in, and Jesus said, I'm coming in, and I'm going to set up shop, and the kingdom of God is now within you. It's where he reigns and he rules, but you've got to allow him to reign and rule in your thought life, and you've got to allow him to reign and rule in your body, in your flesh, in your soul, which is your mind, intellect, and emotions. You have to give place to this. You have to, you have to prove this out, the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You have to prove this out. Getting into the word and finding out what belongs to you. The Bible says Christ redeemed us. In Galatians, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Galatians 3.13. Well, wait a minute. What's the curse of the law? Well, the curse of the law was threefold. Poverty, sickness, and spiritual death. All these curses will come on you for disobedience, he said in Deuteronomy. And if you read that list of curses, it even says, if it's not even mentioned in this book, that's part of the problem. That's what you're going to have to deal with if you're disobedient. But he redeemed us from that curse. That means he redeemed us from everything that ails us. You can expect deliverance every single time, not just hoping so and wishing so, but every single time. But you have to do something with your thought life. Because your life tends to go in the direction of your most dominant thoughts. Let me try to tie this in for you. We want you to experience the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I want you to have the peace of God in every circumstance. I don't know if you've ever had the peace of God. I don't know if you've had the tangible peace of God. Not very many people have. The only way that you would know that you've had the peace of God is that when you find yourself in the middle of hell. When you find yourself in the middle of hell that would destroy you emotionally, but yet you are overcome and overwhelmed by this peace that passes all understanding and it makes no sense. And when you should be panicked and freaking out, you're not. You're just sailing right on through because you just know everything is well in hand. Look at this in Philippians. In verse uh, chapter 4, this would be Philippians chapter 4 in our closing moments. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord when you feel like it. And again, I say rejoice when things are going good. No, he just says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He said it twice, didn't he? And he said always. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Watch this. Be careful or be anxious or don't fret or have any anxiety about anything. Verse 6. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. I love this. 
shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's the kingdom of God operating in the midst of the storm, in the midst of dread and panic and worry, in the midst of all kinds of chaos, in, in, in the midst of all kinds of threats and ungodliness. You have this peace that is ruling and reigning. And verse 8, he's going to tell you how to hang on to that peace. Because that's the summary of this message is how do we hang on to this? Because it's all well and good that we see it and we understand it. It's all well and good that Paul simplified the kingdom. He said righteousness, peace, and joy. It's all well and good that he said, hey, do something with your body. Do something with your mind so that you can have the, perfect, the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God in your life. Do something, please, because God doesn't just bust in and take charge. Contrary to what people think, God does not just kick the door down of your life and take charge against your will. But here's how you can hang on to this peace and operate in this peace the further we get to the end when the Bible tells you and promises you it's going to get even uglier. It's going to get even more confusing, so just hang on. Just hang on and understand that this is not a sad time. This is a very happy time. He says, finally, verse 8, finally. What does finally mean to you? Finally. Finally, brethren. Who's he talking to? You. He's talking to you, Thrins. Finally, brethren. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these things. What are you thinking on? What is your mind focused on? What is it that you're thinking on? The Bible tells you, think about the things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of a good report and if there's any virtue and if there's any praise. Listen, all of the confusion and the chaos and the political wrangling and all the baloney that's going on, stop listening to it. Get your news information. Find out what you need to know. But when it turns, when they turn, in, it always goes in the direction of trying to manipulate you and trying to promote their agenda and whatever their political platform. I don't want to hear it. Just give me the facts. Well, three people jumped into the river naked and one of them scraped his bottom. Okay, I don't care anything. I don't care what the reason is, whether it's a mental health issue. I don't care what the pro Listen, none of that matters. I just know the three people jumped in the river naked and one of them got bruised on his butt. That's all I care about. Don't care about nothing else. But we get literally sucked in, don't we? It just sucks us right in. I mean, stop. Stop. Enforce yourself to think about the things that he tells you to think about. In verse 7, he says, those uh, verse 9, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. And the God of peace shall be with you. And the God of peace shall be with you. Well, we certainly need peace, don't we? Yeah. We certainly need to be stable. We need to be confident. We need to be at rest, don't we? We're in great shape. I don't know if you knew this or not, but the Lord Jesus Christ actually said he was going to build his church. He didn't specify denomination. He said, I'm going to build my church. He didn't specify the denomination. He didn't specify anything. He just said, I'm going to build my church. The only thing he said, the only thing he promised about it was, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. What are we fretting and worrying? Well, this is bad. Listen, I know it is, but it's right on cue. What's happening over there in, in Israel? What's going on with Turkey and Iran and all this other nonsense? That's, it's all coming together, folks. It's supposed to. We're not fretting and worrying. We're looking up. The Bible says, look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. I mean, my goodness, there's that trumpet sound, that shout's coming, and we're going to be out of here. And I don't want to have anybody that I know and love left behind. And so it's so important that you live what you say you believe. Make sure everybody you know and love knows, knows what's happening. Well, let me tell you what's going on here. This is not a Democratic thing or a Republican thing. 
This is a spiritual thing. And, and yes, I will admit that we got trouble in the land, but we got glory in the land too. As the darkness increases, so is the glory of God. And the state-run media, I mean the mainstream media, they're not going to focus on the, the things that are going right. Oh, they'll throw you a few token stories just to say, see, we're responsible. We're going to, no, no. There's so much good that is happening that you just don't hear about it. And trust me, you don't want to hear about the other stuff that's going on because it's too much to, to think about. But as long as you stay focused, as long as you know, don't get into any arguments, don't be pointing fingers and criticizing, stay focused. The kingdom of God is not about meat and drink. It's not about r rules and regulations. It's about being right with God. It's about being pleasing to him. It's about being in good favor, good standing with God. It's about peace and it's about joy in the Holy Ghost, but until you take charge of your thought life and until you put your, until you keep your body under, until you, you know, you learn, you learn the lesson that it is your responsibility to keep your body under, you're really not going to experience this in full measure because you're still fighting the same battles. You're still fighting the same battles over and over 15, 25, 35, 45 years later and stop giving yourself an excuse. Well, the Lord knows this is my cross to bear. Is it now? One of the best uh, compliments I had Sunday, I think Lee, it was Sunday. Uh, I think it was a Sunday. You know, Lee, no, Lee's, Lee, we go way back. You know me. I mean, you, you, you know, I mean, he said, geez, you know, I, and I don't know exactly how he worded it, but he said, clearly you've made progress and you haven't stayed still that you're so much better and, and, and he could just see the improvement in the progress. And I, I think I said, after 25 years of being the pastor here, I would hope that there could be progress seen. The sad thing is, after 25 years, you don't see any progress in some people's lives, do you? They're still the same old scoundrel. They still talk the same. They still use the same foul, vulgar language. They still have the same. It's like you just want to say, did you not learn anything in this last quarter century? For some people, it's even longer than that. I love, when, I love when people try to look down on me in a condescending way. Yeah, you know, I went to Bible school too, and uh, you know, I got saved in 1922. And I would hate to admit that I've been saved since 1922 and still have the kind of Christian experience and witness and testimony that they do. I'd be embarrassed. I wouldn't tell anybody that I was a Christian because you could never tell by the way that they live and act and by the things that they do. Crazy, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll tell you what we're going to do now. Wow, you guys let me keep you this long in the sweltering heat? Just for that, we're going to receive an offering. Glory to God. Now, why do we receive offerings? Well, I'll tell you what. You can worship God with your substance. Did you know that? Your checkbook reveals a lot about you, your heart. Where your finances and your resources go reveals a lot about, you can tell a lot about somebody by looking at their checkbook. And I know we don't, you know, checkbooks are kind of obsolete anymore. I, my wife, we still write checks. Church, we still write checks. I mean, thank God that there are still people that write checks. But there are other ways that people give and we appreciate all of the ways in which people do support the work in which we are doing. Uh, people give online, people give through, uh, you know, they go to the website or however. I mean, we still get checks in the mail. Uh, people still, you know, put the offerings in the plate. And it's a wonderful thing because it enables us to continue doing what we're doing. So however you want to help get involved, we want to receive that with gratitude. And we want to present it to the Lord and use it for God's business. That's what we do. And that's what we're all about. And, and don't ever feel bad. Don't, don't ever feel bad that, uh, you know, gee, I want to, because I've had people say this to me through the years, you know, I, I really want to do more. So I'll be honest with you, Pastor, I'm, I'm just going to wait until things turn and then I'll start giving. Don't, don't do that because the devil will see to it that it'll never turn. And, and, and for some people, I've seen this as well. Things go, I mean, we've watched it happen. We've watched people's circumstances turn around and get really good for them. And then they somehow forget that we were the ones praying for them and encouraging them and helping them get to where they got to. And then they just forget all about you. 
And so don't ever make the mistake of thinking, well, when I hit it big, then I'll... No, 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 no. If you're not faithful now with the little bit that you have, you won't be faithful later when you get a whole lot more. You have to prove faithfulness now. And I never want to uh, withhold an opportunity because I am believing God for certain things. I am praying and believing God to do certain things. And how do I know that he hasn't been speaking to your heart right now? And you've been thinking, you know, I can't get away from this, but the Lord has told me to drop a million dollars in the plate to Pastor Gary personally. Well, that is God. Just, just make sure you spell my name right. But I don't know. I don't know what God and you are talking about right now. So I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for the church. And then Chris is going to pass uh, the offering plate. Father, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. I want to thank you that you are faithful to us. And I want to thank you for the privilege, Lord God, of being a steward over everything. We don't own anything, Lord God. We are stewards over everything. This church belongs to you. Father, the air that we breathe is yours. We thank you that you keep us alive. We thank you for the privilege of ministering your word, of preaching your gospel, of loving on one another, of looking out for each other. And Father, thank you for the faithfulness and generosity of this church. I call this church blessed. I say that every need in this church is met and every need of this church is met to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, brother, go ahead and receive that. And again, thank you for, for being so patient. Uh, we will be back uh, this Sunday. I just want to let you know this is Father's Day coming up, um, if you can believe that. Uh, Monday, I believe we have our Men of Honor. Terry, is that right, this Monday, Men of Honor again? Uh, so we'll be in the fellowship room at 630 Unless it's 118 degrees, then you can probably stay home and get in a cold shower. Uh, but uh, we'll plan on Sunday for Father's Day and Monday for the men's group. Uh, anything else that I am omitting and forgetting, I apologize. Any birthdays, anniversaries, celebrations, special things, happy birthday, happy anniversary. We celebrate with you. We celebrate you. And we thank you for the faithfulness of everybody. Thank you so much. I love you. I'm going to let you guys go there on the uh, Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again real soon. Love you.